Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Um, I am with Stephanie Esquieta, who is the events content uh, manager at Coindesk. And Stephanie, um, I am so glad you're here because like we were saying right before the session began, this is the big issue in content marketing. How do you handle events? And you at Coindesk put on consensus and which is a huge, huge conference. Could you, could you tell the audience uh, uh, just how big the conference is just to give them a, a sense of, of, of the work that you do? Sure. Uh, so our peak year was 2018. We had about 8,000, 9,000 attendees in person. That was the first year that Bitcoin hit 20,000. So everyone was trying to understand what was going on, you know, why this, you know, internet money was this fake magical internet money was was being valued at so highly. So that was the year that I think I forget which publication covered it and said that the Lambos were out uh, because there was literally people who rented Lambos just to like show off at this conference. Um, and then virtually our first year that we did a virtual conference, which is 2020, everyone pivoted. Uh, we had about 20,000 people attended virtually. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's been a lot. <laughs> Phenomenal. And I want Lambos at next year's Managing Editor Live. Um, <laughs> one of the things, uh, we actually met at an event um, when I was at Common Bond and um, I forget exactly what it was. I think it was like about product management. And um, we, we kept in touch. And I, I think that you, you have like a fascinating uh, career path. I mean, you worked in tech, you worked in cannabis, and now you're, uh, now you're at Coindesk with Bitcoin um, and cryptocurrency in general. Um, and, and so thank you so much for uh, taking time to talk to us about what the future of multiversal experiences are. And um, in this session, you're going to learn how to develop an approach to creating events that, that boost engagement and leave people wanting more. And um, I think Stephanie is, is, is perfectly positioned to really lay out what is the future of the events landscape in terms of content, in terms of programming looks like. So, um, let, let's start at the, the, the beginning, um, Stephanie. And can you tell me what, it drew you, what drew you to events work? Uh, sure. So I think for starters, uh, in a sense, the practicality of it, I studied philosophy in college, which, you know, to my parents' uh, disbelief is probably not the most uh, practical career major. Uh, but it, it taught me really how to write. It taught me how to think clearly. It taught me how to really uh, see both sides of an argument. Um, so then that kind of naturally, like I've always been a voracious reader. That was something my mom instilled in me. Um, so I actually was part of a civics class, an AP government class in, in high school, that part of our, you know, assigned task was to read a lot to understand what was going on in the world. Uh, so that I kind of picked up that habit there. And then I took that on to college. And in college, I met a friend who organized TEDx events. And I was just at that time, I think it was 2011-ish, 2012, TEDx was at like the height of, you know, prominence, so to speak. Everyone, you know, either wanted to do a TED Talk or organize a TEDx event. So I just read a lot, of, a lot, um, different topics, technology, uh, politics, uh, food, anything. I, I just absorbed it. Uh, and so I, he was graduating. So he kind of, we just be, we became friends and he just was, you know, he basically was like, would you like to take this on after I leave? And it was just like a natural fit. I, you know, studying philosophy, I like talking about a lot of different things. And by nature, philosophy is something that's face to face. Like that's the beauty of being in a philosophy classroom. Like you can read about it, but you're supposed to discuss it and, and think about it and have these deep conversation of, of what it is that you read and why, you know, why is it ethical? Why is it unethical? So on and so forth. So that's kind of how I got into events. I started being a TEDx organizer um, with a group of two other people. And then from there, I think that was my sophomore year of college and I, I never looked back. Excellent. Before I get to the next question, do you have a favorite philosopher? Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot because we didn't talk <laughs> about this one. <laughs> yeah, we didn't talk about that. Um, I, I guess he's not technically uh, categorized as a philosopher, but Naval Ravenkot, 
He uh, founded oh. a- Angel, and he's he's looked at as a modern philosopher of sorts. Uh, a lot of tech people follow him, but I I, I really like the way he presents um, information and just you know he he has a he has a great uh, podcast series on how to get rich, and it's very like simple uh, basics. It's nothing like you know it, it, people money is and i think that's why like crypto money is seen as this mythology uh, almost like this mystic thing that is really hard to understand but it, it, it's kind of just you know breaking it down to its fundamentals and you you kind of understand the basics of, of the game because money is a game in a sense love it so segueing into what is can you talk to everybody about like what is your philosophy when it comes to events content um i read a lot i mean these days i kind of focus on crypto because that's just the niche I'm in. Uh, but my philosophy w- would be, you know, try to read outside of what it is that you're trying to produce just because um, I-, I don't know if anyone watches uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Like there's that scene where Charlie's like mapping out all these connections, right? And like, I think that's a good content producer is able to do that, synthesize and map out connections across different uh, verticals, across different industries. Um, because in-, in to some degree, I think certain topics overlap. Uh, so I tend to just try to read as much as obviously in my, my field, but try to read outside of it to get inspired, get new ideas, see how the rest of the world is functioning while I'm in my, my little internet money world. That's great. Could you talk about um, what is the workflow of your typical day like? I mean, how like consensus is a huge event. Could you just talk about like the planning of it and what what your role is and I, I know you were just on a conference with a bunch of trying to get a couple senators to go come to a consensus so could you just talk about the planning and, and your day-to-day workflow sure so um, the beginning of my day and i want to say like literally the beginning as i wake up because i have twitter alarms on uh for specific people is to see what they've been tweeting about uh so i read a lot twitter that's kind of like I don't want to say my source of truth because it's obviously social media, but a lot of people put out great content on Twitter. So I, I follow a lot of like, I guess the influencers of the industry. Um, I read a lot of newsletters. I mean, it's a nice way to just get the, you know, the, the meat and potatoes, so to speak of, of what the news is for the day or for the week. Um, and then obviously I read news sites. Um, and then obviously I, I read my, I read the core crypto publications. And then I have to read outside of that, like Wall Street Journal, New York Times to see what mainstream media is talking about my industry uh, and then podcast. Uh, but I do, you know, I do want to say that with all that, I have to carve out time in which I'm not trying to actively consume that much content uh, when it comes to crypto. And I'm, I'm actually just passively enjoying things because otherwise I, I feel like it's happened to me in cannabis where it's like you kind of lose the joy of it. A little mm-hmm. bit, so I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm trying for that not to happen in this space for me. That makes sense. Can we talk about your tactics and tips um, in terms of producing events content? Do you do you have any particular tools um, that that you are fond of? Um, so I think Twitter is a great resource to just get ideas of what your audience is actually talking about what they're interested in. And, and I think it's also a great place to view trends. Um, I think tools for me to actually help organize all these ideas, Airtable, I used to not be a fan of it just because I, it, I don't know, I found it com- complex, but once I got the hang of it, it's just such a, it's, it's like Excel on steroids. It's such a great tool to just like map out everything you, you need to to just put to put a, a on an, a program together, right? So it allows me to just visually see where I'm placing certain speakers, where I'm placing certain themes, conversations, um, and it also it's a great collaborative tool where everyone in the in your you know team or company what what have you can see in one place uh, where you know where the content is. They can see where the sponsors are. Um, you know, it, it has tabs. It's it's just an awesome tool that. I'm so glad that the previous set of events that my company implemented, um, and it's you know ironic because I was so against it at first, and then once I actually use, utilized it, it just was I was like I don't know how we could run an event without it. So, what advice would you give um, our audience who, who, who's thinking through events content? Like, if you had to to, to boil down your your advice or strategy into into one thing that they could do, what would that be? Um, get, you know, just, you know, if you're looking for someone to, pro- to produce this events, like just get someone who's curious. And like, I think sometimes, you know, we, we 
sometimes people put more emphasis on like, has this person done this role before over has this per does this person have the curiosity and the tenacity to put a program together? Um, and, and, you know, wh what is their hustle? Cause you know, sometimes there's people who've done this type of role in previous places and they just are very comfortable doing the same thing. Um, you should be looking for the type of person or you yourself should become the type of person who's willing to get outside the mold, experiment, and, and not be afraid to be wrong, right? Like some, especially in the year and a half that we've had through COVID, we've all had to experiment with a lot of things uh, where we didn't know if it was gonna, you know, if we were gonna get a, you know, a return of our investment, if this was the right decision, but, you know, like the saying goes, high risk, high reward. Um, and that's some of the things we pulled off at, at Consensus this year, right? We, uh, we pulled off something called a uh, desk coin, which was a uh, non-tradable uh, token, basically, that we gamified where we would drop it in some of our virtual conversations and people were able to redeem it for these NFTs that we created on all like in-house kind of platform. Uh, and people were really engaged. It, we actually saw the highest engagement ever in our virtual experience because of desk. Um, and, and again, we didn't know if it was going to be successful. We didn't even know if it was going to fully work by the time the event was going to take place, but we took that risk and it, and it paid off. That's so cool. What, what, um, are the biggest mistakes you, you, you see brands or organizations making when it, when it comes to producing events? Um, I think sometimes just because it worked for the, your competitor doesn't mean it works for you. Um, and I think just really honing in on what it is that you're good at, uh, you know, you should just champion that. Like, I'm a big believer that there's, you know, we can throw so many ideas and see what sticks, but really I'm, I'm a believer of three, right? Like do three things really well. And that's what people are going to remember you for. If you try to do 10 things, the likelihood of you executing all of them well is pretty low. Uh, just because given, you know, how much time it takes to do, to, you know, get, especially if it's experimental, like experiential, excuse me, it, it just takes so much time to like, see if the idea is even going to work. Um, if the audience even has an appetite for it, um, so I, I think just sticking to that and then also like, you know, trust is such a tough thing to build. And once you lose it, it's hard to get people to get back on board. I mean, we saw that a great example is Robin Hood within the last year. A lot of people saw Robin Hood as their first entry point into trading stocks, myself included. Uh, that was the first, you know, before E-Trade, before Charles Schwab, that was my first introduction to buying assets, right? Like Robin Hood. But what happened in the last year with the whole GameStop controversy and the AMC controversy, right? Like the big squeezes that happened within the last year and then kind of put it halting trading on it. They lost a lot of customers and they lost a lot of their brand rec uh, reputation, uh, which is something that took them years to build. And in an instant, they, they, you know, it's obviously it's still there, but a lot of people went to a different platform because they, they just didn't like what they were doing. Uh, that is. And uh, Diana in, uh, uh, in our audience says, I mean, that, that's a wonderful example about um, a, a trusted relationship. And I couldn't agree with her more. Um, what, in terms of like the future of events content, I feel like you are so well positioned just in the nature of like your background in the industries that you've worked in. Um, it, it seems like you're very much on the like bleeding edge. Um, so without without stealing any of the thunder of your presentation here, what, like high level, where do you see the, the future of events content going? Um, I think most event content, whatever industry you kind of partake in, you have to have just high conviction on what it is you're producing. I think, I think content will look like almost um, a conversation more, so like, right, there's this, this conversation around, uh, in my world, right, in crypto, where it's like web one, web two, web three, Web one was reading, just reading the internet, right? Web two, which is like Facebook, social media was more like you interacting with the internet, right? And web three is gonna be this conversation of you reading, writing, but also building on top of the internet. And I think that's that's the next iteration of event content where we're gonna begin seeing the audience wanting to almost take part in the production of what's, of what's taking place of the content that's being put forth. And, you know, the, there's this uh, book that was written by Alexis Ohanian, uh, co-founder of Reddit, founder of 776 Fund. Uh, he wrote it years ago, right? It's without your permission. And he pretty much predicted in some ways this future where creators are gonna do it with or without you. And you have to become, you know, able to be flexible and adapt with the changing times. And like, I'm sure event content producers know this, at least for my team, sometimes we're literally 
revamping or changing pieces of the agenda literally right up until the day before the event. And that's something that depending on your industry, you have to be good at and, and just roll with, roll with the punches, so to speak. Excellent. Well, um, I would, I know we'll have a couple more questions for you after your presentation, but I just uh, want you to jump in and talk about multiversal events and, um, and, and sort of why we should be doubling down on this. So, sure. um, all right, yeah. um, I will right. join for Q and A at the end. Thank all you. Right, no problem. Thanks, Tom. Um, so mirror world doubling down on multiversal events. So I want to start off with hybrid events are not the future. They're the now. I think the idea that what do the future of events look like? And then, you know, the obvious answer hybrid, um, is no longer a question of, is this going to happen? It's already happening. The fact that we're having this conversation to begin with means that we're, you know, light years of where we were pre COVID. Um, you know, I think, you know, or not, I think I know COVID accelerated a lot of phenomenons that people thought wouldn't happen until 10 years. It kind of just shortened that, that time span. Um, and, you know, this is just a, a, a statistic that was done by event manager blog slash skiff, just asking, you know, through their a survey and their virtual event tech guide, you know, will content people try to keep event organizers try to keep their live audience or, you know, virtual audience when they go back to live events. And obviously, yes, uh, you know, before COVID, most people just saw uh, live events or, excuse me, uh, virtual events as the streaming opportunity, right? That you can sell, that you can market, get a sponsor to 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 book the cost, et cetera. But now we've come to realize that it's not just a, a passive experience. We have to actually have some kind of active experiential end to it. And I think this in the last year and a half, all event organizers have been trying to figure out that question. Um, but that being said, although I think the future, uh, the future of events is, is, excuse me, although I think the hybrid is the presence of events, um, it's not without problems, right? And I'm sure everyone in this, in this audience experienced that. Um, there's lower attendee engagement to, com to the complexities of networking and virtual audiences. Uh, there's problems in trying to find the right platform. Uh, I, I actually like this platform they were using big markers, actually pretty nice. I hadn't used it before, but you know, every platform has something great and then something that it falls short on and i think as an event organizer it's always our jobs to figure out what's the the best platform meeting most of our needs um and obviously um i think there hasn't been one that does it all um uh, but i'm looking forward to to a platform that figures it all out um and trust me i've, I've gone through quite a few of them with my team um and then i, I guess i want to start off the the part of the the metaversal conversation right is a lot of people are, you know, and don't get me wrong. I love live events. I go to live music all the time. That was the thing that was killing me during COVID that I wasn't able to go to live music. I'm a big music fan. That's what I did most of my early twenties. Um, and then the, having that kind of taken away from me uh, was just very shocking. Um, but I want to, I want to encourage people to, to remember what every time someone, when you become a Luddite to towards change, uh, what happens, right? And this is just a funny uh, cartoon, you know, comic book that I that I found, right, when Socrates was, um, was against writing, right, he saw that as as almost beneath human beings, right, like he in his in his thought process, it was more important for an individual to have these face to face conversations, which I agree, they're important. But the reality is, as much as we talk through, talk to each other and gain information, uh, it's hard to retain it all and, and not forget things. So he was against writing, which is ironic because the only reason we know about him is because people wrote, well, Plato wrote about him. That's the only reason we remember any of his teachings as wise as they were. Um, so, you know, it goes to show you, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's a little funny, but it goes to show you, you, you should become a, even if maybe you won't use it today, just knowing a little bit of what this technology does is important uh, because it will probably be, you know, stay, stick around. So the metaverse, uh, the metaverse is this really huge buzzword that's that's uh, that's been taking place. Uh, I want to say in the last few months, like in crypto, it was a it was a much more common word uh, over the last year. Um, and I think that crypto was maybe one of the first spaces that once COVID hit, um, they started really talking about the metaverse, talking about VR, talking about what a a world in which we interact only online looks like, because much. A lot of crypto has been built with people never having face-to-face -face, um, 
uh, time. And it's solely done through the internet. So I think it, that specific uh, niche of people were just very well versed and equipped to take on a world where you couldn't see each other because of, of COVID. Um, and I also want to remind people that these communities or these metaverses um, aren't really that new in a sense. Uh, so this is like a land party uh, for I'm, I'm a, maybe a little too um, young for these, but I, I know of, of some of my older friends that participated in these uh, right land parties. You would literally physically take your huge computer, right, which wasn't a laptop back in the 90s and early 2000s. It was this clunky desktop tower and you would go to one person's house and bring all your computers and play these games, whether it was WoW, whether it was League of Legends, what have you, and connect and just these were LAN parties back in the day. So these communities of these online internet communities have kind of always existed, but they just keep getting, um, I guess, more sophisticated in a sense, because you don't now when you see people playing video games or playing, doing something interactively online, they're not lugging their computer from point A to point B. They just log on the same way you, got, you guys are logging on to the, to the internet and watching a presentation or watching Netflix together or playing a video game together. Um, and I, I want to, so uh, for people who talk about the metaverse, there's two, I think, big entry points, right? And Stephen, uh, excuse me, Neil Stevenson was the first person to really coin the term in his book, Snow Crash. And then, so that's one generation of people that learned about the met metaverse. Like that's the, the first half of it, right? I'm more of the later half of it that uh, learned about the, meta the metaverse, the concept of it uh, through Ready Player One, which is uh, a book, but also got adapted into the film by Steven Spielberg. Um, you guys should watch it. It's, it's, it's fun. You can watch it with your kids. It's, it's, a, it's a great vision onto what I think the not only events, but really what our work life uh, will look like in the future. Um, yeah, Diana, <laughs> Ready Player One's a great book and movie. Um, so this is I, I this picture is kind of an illustration of how we actually live our lives today. Um, obviously, there's not a full fledged metaverse right now. There's concepts of it, right? There's Oculus VR. There's there's the sets that kind of bring you into the metaverse, and there's a few platforms from Alt Space from alt space VR to VR chat that exist uh, for you to interact in this metaverse like experience. But I, I guess I want you guys to realize through this image is that we kind of already live in it. Um, I like to say it's a 2D metaverse versus a 3D metaverse where you can be, and, and I'm sure you guys experience this, right? When you can be at dinner or on the couch watching something or, or eating with someone and they're in two places at once, right? Because they're on their phone. Uh, yes, it's rude. I do want to acknowledge that, but it's a reality. People live in two worlds at once. And my long theory is that at one point, these worlds will, they're already blending, but they're, they're going to further blend. Um, and, you know, what's evident of that is, or the most, or one of the early evidence of that, right, is our social media presence. We all have some kind of public image that we uphold on the inter internet, whether that's LinkedIn, whether that's Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, Instagram. Uh, but these are, extensions of ourselves that live on the internet and that we up we have we make you know there's people who literally his whole job is to like you know like to take care of someone's online uh, persona on the internet uh but we ourselves do that every single day uh and and i just wanted to make that visual uh that visual possible so you guys understand that the metaverse has kind of always been there in the background lurking it's just now that we have the technology and, and frankly the internet speed uh to get it to where some of these sci-fi books and movies um, talked about. And this guy, I'm sure you guys remember him. I know he uh, he's wearing a different color shirt. He's usually wearing gray, but Mark Zuckerberg, um, founder and CEO of Facebook, this year announced that he went, that Facebook is no longer a social media company. It's a metaverse company. So I just, you know, and I put him there, not because I necessarily agree entirely with his approach to the metaverse because there's and this is a longer conversation right there's an open source metaverse and a closed uh source metaverse um and most likely given what facebook is it'll be closed source um but he is pivoted or, or is pivoting his company to be a metaverse company so you know my money is on the guy who is really really rich uh already has one of the most successful powerful companies in the world, right? He's, he's at Congress, I feel like every other week or so, uh, debating as to whether Facebook is too big uh, to fail, et cetera. And he, he's pivoted and it's because he, he understands that this is the direction that the world is taking, right? Ba maybe back in like early 2011, some of us were like hesitant about social media or thought it wasn't gonna get as far as it has today. But I mean, if we look at just the history of social media, 
uh, both in terms of users to the money it's made to ads to how it's changed content, how it's changed newsrooms. Um, I can only imagine what the metaverse is going to do to all of that plus more. Um, so that being said, um, you know, I, I there's this quote that he has, it's also a podcast, but this quote that Alexis Ohanian said, right, uh, now everything is community. If companies don't have a community event strategy, they better get one because community led companies are the future and community can create a competitive advantage. And I guess I'm juxtapositioning that and applying that that messaging, not to just companies, but to events. If your event doesn't have a community event strategy, um, you, you need to get one and you need to figure out uh, how to apply it, who your community is, who are your champions. And obviously we know who are the influencers, uh, who, you know, marketing takes care of that, who are people that are always talking about your brand, but to really, but it's not just these one influencers, right? Because these influencers also have followers, which is their community. And I think creators of this generation really understand that, that they have a lot more power than the big brands. And in some cases, uh, the individuals have more power than the brand. Um, and these are just examples of how some companies have been able to leverage their community as well as find these amazing partnerships. This is a picture of Travis Scott having a concert during COVID. I forget what month of COVID, but uh, I think this was mid, maybe later half of 2020. And he had this full blown concert in um, in Fortnite. And for, for those that may not know, Fortnite is this free game uh, that's I think available on most uh, console uh, systems as well as uh, PC, and you can play. It's free to play. I think the only, how they get money is that people buy um, like downloadable content to add to their players and enhance their players. Uh, but they hosted this this um, this music event, and it got almost a million people to participate in Fortnite. And I'm sure there was people who were not Fortnite players, but participated solely because tra they like Travis Scott. They thought it was it was cool, innovative to have a concert in this virtual environment. And again, this isn't like the, the, the stereotypical metaverse in the sense that where you put on a headset, but these online communities all live with on the internet. And, you know, they, they for, I'll speak for myself. I was much more a gamer in my earlier years. Um, some of these people that I played video games were like some of my best friends at the time where I would like, you know, after school, you know, after high school, go play video games, chat, talk about my day. It's it, it was re it was real, and it still is real for a lot of people. Um, Burning Man's another great example. So this actually is a, a true metaverse, uh, a, a true metaverse experience. Uh, lat in 2020, since they couldn't have Burning Man in a phys in the physical location and how it usually is in Nevada, they've pivoted to alt chat VR, uh, alt space, excuse me, alt space as well as some other VR platforms, and they had a complete Burning Man experience for a week in VR. Um, I actually recently connected with um, one of the team organizers spearheading this initiative last year and this year. And they said they had, usually Burning Man has what, like about um, 20,000 people in, in, in person. And they said they got almost 80,000 people to attend Burning Man VR, uh, completely free, virtual, uh, roughly, I want to say a six of those people were using VR headsets. Grant, you know, we have to take the caveat that VR is still somewhat new to a, a large margin of the population. And it's only been recently that some of these headsets have become more affordable. I think the, the most affordable one right now is the Oculus 2, which is about $299. Um, and, but what I found most interesting about that 80,000 number is that he, the, the guy said it was about 40% of those people were new to the Burning Man VR community. So I think just like the discovery audience aspect of people who've never interacted with your brand is just huge in this interactive um, environment. And then finally, um, you know, I mentioned earlier in the conversation, I'm a big fan of music events. I love live events. Like music is like a little bit as, like entropy for me. Uh, but I also have to understand that that's part of, you know, my reluctance that music is changing for some people. So this is an example of a, of a VR chat screenshot of people going to a nightclub. Uh, this is a real DJ. So that means that someone is wearing a headset, really DJing, doing this, you know, live and people partying in the background. And as you can see, um, you are able to take on any appearance that you want, which, you know, leads to a whole other, like, I guess, philosophical conversation of like, face to face time. It is still face to face time because when you're in these spaces, you're still talking to people. It's your voice. It's your sound. It's your thoughts. 
but your appearance might be completely different. I can present myself as a robot. I can present myself as a fox. I can present myself as a human, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it, it, it just, the possibilities of, of, of this environment are, are almost <laughs> limitless, um, which is quite uh, riveting for people that, that maybe they're, maybe they're introverts, maybe, you know, it, it's different for everyone, but I, I think it's exciting. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, there's a huge conversation of whether the metaverse um, is going to take on a completely VR um, lane or is it going to take an AR lane? And so the title of this talk is Mirror World. Um, and my long uh, prediction, my long term prediction is that we are going to begin to mirroring our physical world in these virtual environments. And uh, the way that we apply this to events is, let's say, for example, you are your conference is in somewhere like New York City. You create, you obviously host your physical conference, but then you create an environment that looks very similar to your either the hotel you're hosting the conference at or the city you're hosting the conference at, and you 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 integrate the content within that mirror world. And the reason that's that I I guess propose that this is going to be the future is because COVID changed the word the way that people interact with events. Some people no longer see it as necessary to travel for events. Some people say that you need to have that face to face time. But the reality is that some for some people traveling for events really is inaccessible. And as we continue to talk about environmental harm to the um, to the planet, as we continue to talk about accessibility and inclusion, um, this is a great way to. Uh, make it more accessible to people around the world that may normally not be able to attend in person. Um, and I think that's that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, anybody who has questions for Stephanie, please email me at tom at refcap.com. Stephanie, uh, thanks again. Um, you've really uh, changed. Uh, you've given me a lot to think about when it comes to events content and have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks.